Welcome to another seminar series from the Blue Mountain Natural Resources Institute. I'm the Institute Manager, Larry Hartman. The Blue Mountains Natural Resources Institute is a part of the Pacific Northwest Station of Forest Service Research and is also funded by the Pacific Northwest region of the National Forest System. Our territory includes all of the Blue Mountains, including 10 counties in Oregon and four counties in Washington. The Institute achieves its success by working with its partners which include federal, state, tribal, and local government agencies, as well as industry, environmental organizations, private landowners, and educational institutions. The Institute does three main types of activities. First, we offer educational activities and technology transfer, including seminars like this one. And we do research management tours, publications, videos, and we even sponsor conferences. Second, we conduct applied research, which is designed to meet real-world resource management problems. Third, the Institute serves as a neutral forum for discussing environmental issues so that people or organizations with differing opinions can get to understand one another better. This presentation exemplifies the Institute's goal, putting science to work. It's part of our ongoing commitment to bring science results to resource managers and to the general public. This seminar series is entitled Fire Ecology and Management in the Blue Mountains, which explores the role and function of fire in the ecosystem. The second of the five sessions looks at two subjects, the effects of fire on amphibians and reptiles, and soil and cambium temperatures associated with prescribed burning. I hope you enjoy it. I've been uh, working in prescribed fire research since uh, 1964 and uh, the first part of my research uh, involved the southeastern part of the United States which Henry will tell you a whole lot more about and then uh, I moved to Arizona and we picked up a lot of research uh, with regard to ponderosa pine <clears throat> and I'm glad that that I'm able to talk to you about the ponderosa pine because I think a lot of eastern Oregon has uh, similar situations as we do uh, there in Arizona. Arizona and New Mexico together have the most extensive ponderosa pine forest in the world and it stretches from Williams, uh, Arizona all the way over into New Mexico. And so <clears throat> the expanse of ponderosa pine and the nature of its uh, ecology is uh, all involved around fire. And uh, I'd like to get started with uh, my slides. Oh, I gotta have, I gotta put in a plug for the company. Uh, the uh, fire lab at Riverside, California is close to 30 years old now and it is the third of the fire labs in the United States. Macon, Georgia was the first one, <clears throat> and then Missoula, Montana, and then uh, finally Riverside, California. And uh, a lot of the research uh, at uh, Riverside is no longer fire research. There are other projects that are now part of the South uh, Pacific Southwest Station, but, um, but a lot of fire research still goes on there. Uh, I was moved to, Flag, to uh, Riverside from Flagstaff where most of our research was going on and we still uh, do a lot of research there. The Ponderosa Pine, like I told you, uh, stretches over most of Arizona and uh, into New Mexico and is, uh, like I said, the most extensive um, Ponderosa Pine forest in the world. And it grows uh, basically um, as pure stands, but uh, the stands are not as um, a lot of forest stands are. Uh, the um, pre-settlement times, ponderosa pine grew uh, more or less as a savanna, that uh, it was basically a grass culture with scattered trees. And today it's a totally different form. It, um, uh, after the grazing and lumbering that took place at the turn of the century and the uh, fire suppression that took place after that has transformed ponderosa pine into what we see today <clears throat> which is basically a continuous stand and uh, it has uh, two different well three different overstories I would say 
uh, basically are, there's the old growth which is left from uh, the remnant stands of, of uh, pre-settlement times, which are called yellow pines to us. And then um, what happened after that, at the turn of the century or shortly thereafter, 1914 and 1919 were gigantic siege years. And with uh, the grazing that had taken place, extensive grazing that took place uh, during that time period just before, uh, there was bare ground just about everywhere. In fact, a lot of research was started uh, in Arizona because of that problem. But anyhow, uh, the seed catches of 1914 and 1919 are what make up the rest of Ponderosa pine in uh, Arizona and New Mexico, that uh, we have two different overstories in that situation. Uh, they're either dog hair thickets, which are uh, stagnated uh, pines that never got past their stage because of the competition that uh, exists there, and then there are the pole stands, which somehow um, were scattered enough to the point where the competition allowed them to get up and get out and become uh, relatively more mature trees uh, of today. And so <clears throat> the um, pre-settlement times where fire was a constant occurrence in Ponderosa Pine, and I'll go to the next slide, I think that shows uh, on all, almost all of the uh, remnant trees from uh, pre-settlement times, uh, you'll find fire scars on just about every tree. And a lot of the work that we did uh, in starting our work in, in Arizona, uh, centered around um, fire histories. And I'm going to show you a couple of uh, scars that come out of these trees. Uh, there are some that are on fire. Would you pass that around just so that people can see it? Well, I would just, uh, I can show them a picture, but I just assume they, people don't believe me when I show them pictures. <laughs> and there are those scars again. Uh, the. Uh, the constancy of, of fire in Ponderosa Pine in Arizona, New Mexico uh, is shown in, in these fire scar analyses. And uh, on the study plots that we have outside of Flagstaff, uh, basalt soils, uh, on the Fort Valley Experimental Forest, um, the, uh, the overall average fire occurrence was about every two to three years. Uh, from the time period you see on that, that scar there. And that's, that's an excellent scar that shows um, extensive <clears throat> fire history. Uh, if you look to the, that's a very old uh, tree, but it was a very small tree, as you can see. And uh, please note when you're passing that around, the outside rings there. All the trees around this particular uh, yellow pine were cut in 1967. And you can see uh, the release that took place. That's, to, to foresters, that's probably more um, interesting than the, than the fire scars themselves. So what we had in the old days was a fire that maybe didn't look like this because it was running through grass most of the time. But anyhow, low intensity fires that, that occurred on a um, very, very frequent um, timetable now uh, have turned into this kind of, of situation, which is, uh, in most cases, a stand replacing fire. So the old fires pre-settlement that burned on a regular basis have now been replaced by these stand replacing fires, which are devastating and, and have to be replanted rather than, than reseeded because of the nature of them. The culprit in all of this, as we see it anyhow, is the forest floor. And uh, most people are not concerned, especially when you talk to people in the Pacific Northwest where uh, most of the fuel that accumulates that is being burned in prescribed fires is some kind of activity generated fuel. Whereas our fuels, uh, although we have that kind of fuel, um, in um, broadcast prescribed fires, uh, this is the culprit here, the forest floor. and. Um, these are uh, some of the loadings that we've developed. This is a regression uh, showing uh, the depth of the forest floor and the uh, loading. And they're just gigantic uh, amounts of dry material that accumulates over time. <clears throat> the problem is that our decomposition rate is so slow. Uh, this is what's known as a K value, which is uh, decomposition, and it's uh, it's the annual forest floor accumulation divided by the long-term equilibrium forest floor, which has, occurred, has accumulated 
uh, on those ponderosa pine forests since the turn of the century. And uh, as you see, uh, if you were in the tropics or even uh, down in Henry's part of the world, um, uh, a K value of 1, 1 1.0, would be fuel accumulating on the ground and, and decomposing uh, on the, in the same year so that it's never accumulating past a year's accumulation. Well, you can see that in uh, Arizona and New Mexico, it's a completely different uh, picture, that 0 0.05 is the decomposition rate, which if you look at um, ecosystems over the world, it's more like a desert. It's very close to being a desert, that the accumulation uh, just keeps accumulating and decomposes at a very, very slow rate. And that's why fire in the old days took care of that, that situation. We also have, like Henry's area, uh, an extensive um, lightning occurrence. Uh, South Florida is the only place in the United States that has a more dense uh, lightning occurrence than in Arizona and New Mexico. So the ignition source was always there. The fuel was always there. Uh, the weather was always there. And uh, so constant fire was the name of the game, pre-settlement times. The, uh, the work that we were doing in, in Arizona was uh, similar to that that I started or uh, continued in, in, uh, in Florida and uh, South Carolina, and that is to develop prescribed burning um, rotations which, in effect, protect the overstory. Uh, that we knew that uh, fire had to be reinstituted into the ecosystem because it was that natural phenomenon that took care of the, the fuel problem and uh, also did a lot of other things. Uh, so our uh, studies were set up to, um, to look at different burning intervals to protect the overstory. So we set up two study areas, one on basalt soils uh, on the Fort Valley Experimental Forest in, uh, outside of Flagstaff and then one on the uh, Long Valley Experimental Forest, which is a la uh, sandstone, limestone-derived soil. <clears throat> and what we did was set up uh, increments of one, two, four, six, eight, and ten-year rotations. And the idea was to burn those on those rotations and uh, then try and determine which one of those would optimally uh, protect your overstory. And uh, a lot of people look at prescribed fire in that it's a one-time operation, but it is not. And especially in an ecosystem uh, as dry as uh, Ponderosa Pine, that it's a continual thing. Once you start it, you've got to keep it going. So the, uh, the first, uh, all the burn plots were done in 1976. And uh, the conditions that fall, and they're all in the fall, by the way. They are not uh, spring burns or uh, late spring burns, early summer when fire would naturally have occurred. Um, when we first started our study, uh, Region 3, Arizona and New Mexico, uh, you couldn't, there was no way you could burn during that time period because May and June are zero precip months and any fires that were going during that time, uh, even if they were extinguished, they would, they would hold over. So uh, there was a rule in the Forest Service that you just didn't burn them. So the typical time was in the fall when things could be controlled much better. And so that's why we set it up as, as uh, uh, burning in the fall. Uh, the first fall that we burned was a very dry fall, like, uh, like many of them are, and uh, we had to do it at night. So the pictures you see there are our first burns that occurred at night. The uh, fuel loads on the ground, um, you can see around these, uh, uh, this group of yellow pine trees, um, that amounts to forest floor loadings of anywhere from 90 to 120,000 pounds to the acre equivalent right around the base of those trees. And uh, that was before uh, those fires. And that's mineral soil that you see there now. So that entire amount of forest floor was consumed <coughs> in the initial burn, uh, which we refer to as the, the first entry burn after a long period of, of, uh, of not burning. And so um, the other fuels, the, the naturally accumulating larger fuels, were also consumed um, almost totally in, in that first uh, fire. The old uh, punky material was burned completely up, and the solid material was not uh, consumed uh, nearly as much. 
after about a year, about a year and a half after we did these burns, uh, we noticed that some of our uh, yellow pines were starting to get yellow <laughs> uh, in the wrong places. Uh, they were getting yellow in the crowns and they're starting to fade and, um, and uh, eventually uh, die. And to this day, 17 years later, we've lost about 46% of our large mature yellow pines. And it got us to thinking uh, about that situation because none of those trees uh, had been scorched in the overstory at all. They were, uh, you saw the fire, it's very low intensity uh, backing fire in most cases. And um, so we got to thinking about what the situation was. And um, it occurred to us that uh, these deep forest floors that were burning were uh, aggravating uh, things underneath. So we set up a study specifically to look at the soil heating that occurs from burning these heavy forest floors. And uh, we have instrumented and, and burned probably 40 or 50 individual trees, uh, some of them in groups like this, but uh, it only takes an individual tree to look at the, uh, the, um, the temperatures in the soil and in the cambium. And uh, not only does it affect the root system from the burning, but uh, around the base of the tree, the cambium is, is also affected. Uh, that um, ponderosa pine is known to be one of the most resistant species to, to fire. And uh, it is uh, relative to uh, low intensity fires with uh, normal fuel loads that, that they experienced all their lives, not the kind of thing that we find ourselves uh, dealing with today. So we'll select a site, and, um, and what we do is install thermocouples in the ground, and you can see them here. This is a hole. We dig a hole about uh, 12 to 14 inches deep, and then insert uh, six thermocouples, in our case, uh, anywhere from the, the uh, forest floor and soil interface down to about 12 inches. And then... Um, we ignite the area. Oh, and the cambiums are also probed, too. We, we put a series of six uh, thermocouples in the... We cut uh, slots in the bark and uh, insert thermocouples down into the cambium, and the actual uh, probe part of the cambium, or uh, thermocouple, is in the forest floor, um, in the cambium at the forest floor level. And uh, then we ignite the area, and here you can see that we protect the, the thermocouples on the tree because they do stick out a ways. Uh, and uh, that's what you see all that aluminum foil there. And uh, we use data loggers um, to record the information from the thermocouples as, they, uh, as the fire progresses through uh, the stand. And here we have uh, an extensive bank of uh, uh, data loggers recording temperatures in the cambium of the tree and in the soil at different loadings, uh, we try to uh, put our thermocouples in under uh, forest floors of different depths so that we can try and relate the depth of burn or the consumption of the burn uh, to the, the temperatures. And we haven't succeeded at that very well, but uh, that's the way we try to do it. And uh, then we put a fire through it. And um, to date, in all the trees that we've studied since uh, 1980, um, we have gotten complete consumption of, of the forest floor around these uh, yellow pines out to the drip line. Uh, there is a humus layer that forms um, in these yellow pine groves, and it extends all the way to the drip line. When you get past that, the fuel is so thin that uh, it only burns the top off, the L layer and the F layer. But it has been our experience that once a fire uh, carries over an area. In other words, if it will carry on the litter layer, it'll burn all the way to uh, mineral soil. And we've done that uh, in conditions up to 95% moisture content in the humus layer. It just takes a little longer to get rid of it, but it does burn down through. So today we're paying for the transgressions that we've uh, uh, perpetrated on these uh, stands over the last 100 years or so. Um, by allowing uh, fire not to take its active uh, place in, in the environment.
Uh, afterburn uh, to us is not when you don't see any flames. That, that smoldering combustion, that glowing combustion that takes place usually lasts for 12 to 72 hours depending on uh, the conditions. And so the heating uh, takes place for up to a week. Uh, we work in um, uh, Sequoia National Park and we, we instrument a lot of the Sequoia uh, sugar pine uh, burns for uh, Sequoia National Park and uh, the combustion process lasts for uh, five to seven days uh, in many cases. Uh, it takes that long to burn that forest floor down. Um, Afterburn, like I say, is not when the flaming uh, takes place, but uh, after the smoldering combustion or the glowing combustion uh, is eliminated. Here you can see on the bowl of that tree, uh, just about the entire black area is probably where the top of the forest floor is. Uh, what we do is take uh, measuring rods, it's just rebar with a mark on it is all it is, and place those around uh, the area where the, um, the thermocouples are. And then we measure the consumption that way uh, by measuring the depth uh, of what was there before and what was there and what uh, remains afterwards. And there's like 90% of the cases, there's nothing remaining afterwards. But that's the way we measure it. And then that prediction equation I showed you in the beginning is how we figure out what the consumption is. Um, when the... When the, when the um, glowing combustion um, no longer exists, then we take the thermocouples out of the ground and um, just to see exactly where the thermocouple was, we, we try to, to put them in. Uh, they're 12 inches long, so when you put them, insert them in the ground, you don't know exactly where the end of the thermocouple is. So when we dig them out, uh, we're not only measuring the moisture content changes that took place during that time period, but also uh, exactly where that thermocouple was. And here you can see, uh, <clears throat> this is a better idea of how much forest floor there is there. The bottom of those yellow protectors uh, is right at the forest floor line. And you can see there's a long way between that and, and what's left. And uh, what you see is, is ash, and you're really not even looking at the, uh, the mineral soil. And this, um, I don't know if you can see that or not. You can see with the thermocouple, we have uh, cut the bark away exactly where the end of the thermocouple is, and uh, just to show the positioning of it in that case. These um, are some of the traces that we've taken um, that, I, that I brought to show you of, of what kind of temperatures uh, exist uh, during these prescribed fires um, in these mature yellow pine sites. These are cambium uh, temperatures here. And um, soils and cambiums uh, run about the same temperature year round, and it's somewhere between 40 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, these trees have lived under those conditions for millennia. And uh, all of a sudden, one day, we go out and light a match, and they're now up to, um, you can see uh, that one trace there on one spot in the cambium is up to 120 degrees. Uh, protoplasm coagulates uh, in uh, forest part, in um, tree parts, uh, somewhere between 140 and 147 degrees. And there are increments of duration and lower temperatures, which will also do the same thing. And uh, that we're working on now, as a matter of fact. But uh, you can see here that uh, in all the cases, we're uh, above uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for some period of time that uh, uh, this is looking at a two and a half day period of elevated temperatures. Uh, that's another um, cambium temperature trace. That's another cambium trace. You can, these are just uh, examples of, of what happens. <clears throat> Here are the soil temperatures. Now, uh, they're all starting in the 40 to 50 degree range. And uh, you can see the very lowest one on this uh, chart here is 12 inches below the soil surface, and it's, it reached eventually over 90 degrees. So there's a lot of heat uh, being put out. Here's another one a little further uh, away from the tree, and uh, the lower probes are showing 
70 to 80 degrees, something like that. That one's a long way away from a tree, and uh, it, uh, the lower ones don't get much above um, 70 or 80. These are just examples of, of some of the conditions that we've, that we've monitored. There, down to 12 inches, we're up over 160 degrees. So, um, we have a problem. Uh, we need to put fire back into this system to keep it from completely collapsing, but yet uh, we're paying a fairly heavy price in some cases um, when we do that. And uh, it's one of those rock and hard place kind of things. And um, we have found, however, that our work at, um, on our limestone flats area when we burn that the first time, we don't have but maybe a half a dozen trees that were, that were killed by that initial fire. And the difference was that the soil moisture was much, much, much higher than, than uh, our first burns at uh, Chimney Spring and the conditions that we've uh, tested thereafter. That, uh, that heavy moisture in the, in the soil becomes a heat sink and that even though probably the same amount of temperature or uh, energy is being expended by that forest floor, um, it is being absorbed by the moisture in the ground, that it takes a lot of energy to get rid of that water in the soil, whereas the dry soils are uh, allowing, although it doesn't uh, transfer in dry soils quite as well, it goes directly to the roots, whereas it's trying to get rid of water uh, in a wet soil type. And so we find that that's essentially what the differences are. And um, like I say, we are paying today for a lot of the transgressions of not allowing uh, an important part of an ecosystem to play its part. Um, there are just so many things that don't happen in especially a very dry ecosystem like Ponderosa Pine. Uh, we were talking just ahead of this about um, nutrient cycling that uh, with decomposition rates as low as they are in a dry system like that, uh, there's very little nutrient cycling going on. <coughs> and uh, I wish we had the time to go into that because we find gigantic differences in um, the nitrogen component, the uh, available uh, nitrogen components, ammonium and nitrate, after burning that um, in controlled situations, uh, one to three parts per million of ammonium is common. And uh, right after a burn, we go in these yellow pine sites, uh, we go up to close to 100 parts per million. And it remains for about four years. And so our four-year rotations are able to surge that nutrient uh, cycle um, every time we burn it. So there are a lot of things that aren't happening in these ponderosa pine ecosystems that did over a long period of time. And so, like I say, we're caught in a dilemma and um, there are ways around it. Uh, a lot of the dilemma has been taken care of because a lot of the heavy uh, or the big mature trees have been logged out of, of Arizona and New Mexico. And uh, so the upcoming crop of, of blackjacks or the bigger poles uh, will soon take over. And uh, if we get a burning program into those, early enough, then we don't have to worry about that situation. Questions? Yes, sir. During your studies, uh, oh. uh, during your studies, uh, you said you had 120,000 pounds per acre. So I think that would be 60 tons per acre. Now, your, your fuel loading was basically uh, the needle cast off the trees. And, Anything uh, less than an inch in diameter. Okay, so uh, you were getting these these type of intensities on 60 tons of acre of uh, basically uh, uh, one <laughs> one hour fuel class. That's correct. What kind of what kind of duck layer did you roll that? The humus uh, makes the greater the humus depth, uh, the more the consumption. Uh, but that. Um, 
out to the drip line, uh, the humus layer is deep enough for total consumption all the way to the drip line in those situations. And um, right up next to the bowl of the tree, um, it could be higher uh, loading than that. And that's just an average from the inside to the outside. Did any of your study, were any of your studies just in, uh, 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 were all your studies just in basically a needle cast type of fuel loading, or did you do any in grass fine? Our grass uh, has been eliminated, essentially. Um, the, the type, uh, our ecosystem is Ponderosa pine, Arizona fescue. Well, the Arizona fescue component is minute. And uh, you can dig down under these uh, heavy forest floors and you can find the skeletons of Arizona fescue. But um, in 17 years now, we have not seen the Arizona fescue come back. That, that the seed bank is so low at this point that uh, it, it just does not revive. It's gonna take some restoration type ecology, I think, to get that Arizona fescue back into that system. We get a lot of toad flax and mullen and thistle, uh, you know, the things that come in after you devastate a site, uh, but we don't see the grasses coming back in. In the pole stands and dog hair thickets, we do not consume all the forest floor. That just does not happen. You take off the L layer and part of the F layer and everything else is left, uh, essentially. And uh, the condition I explained to you is just around these big old mature yellow pines. In Arizona. Yes. It also, uh, I've got to step back. Um, <clears throat> like I say, we work in Sequoia uh, National Park, and their situation is identical, only they have um, forest floor loads like this all over, not just underneath the crowns, that their, those uh, Sequoia stands are so dense with fir and uh, sugar pine and, and other things that, um, it, it's the same thing. If you can get a fire to carry across the top, it's going to burn the mineral soil. Yeah, but I'm just trying to correlate that to some of the situations we have here in northeastern Oregon, and those fuel loads you're describing are are very, very high. I, you're talking about a uh, fuel layer and a load very close to the surface. It's actually actually a, almost like a peak. It's a very. It's probably a fire you're describing that would be. Uh, uh, long in duration? Yes. Uh, days. Yeah. And in fact, you, it, it is so uh, that the glowing combustion that takes place, very little smoke coming from it. It's extremely efficient fire. Uh, but you can't see it because the ash layer builds up from the top to the bottom, which further insulates and, and drives that heat into the ground. And uh, it's, uh, it just goes on and on and on. The reason I'm asking is that you gave us some temperatures. Uh, 160 degrees at 12 inches is, is quite high. Um, you don't have any data. Let me tell you something about Sequoia. Yeah. We go down to 18 inches and get temperatures not 160 degrees, but they're elevated. For this area, we don't have uh, that much pine succession of pine. Our pine patch is not as dry as yours. We do have more composition. We do still have grass and all of it, but we don't have these foot feet loading needle pads. Mm -hmm. Be sure and use your buttons. It's working. It's working now. Okay, let's, uh, any other questions? One more question. Go ahead. Yeah, all of the studies you did were in areas that had not had recent fire intervals. Uh, did you do any studies in areas where you'd burn and then gone back after three or four years and burned again to look at the heat pulse and mortality. Yeah, our whole study is, is based on burning intervals. And so we've been burning now for 17 years on these different intervals, one, two, four, six, eight, and 10 years. And once that initial load is gone, uh, you never have that situation ever again. And that's the whole point, that you've got to start someplace but once you do, then you don't have those same kind of problems. Then you can work into a, a program that's, even, even at eight years, we don't get uh, a tremendous 
heat buildup. And when, when, when we do, it's only in the very top layers. We do not get it down lower than two or three inches. And, uh, and so it's just not the same. It's just that initial first entry when you have this gigantic load on the ground. Okay, let's go on to the outreaches and uh, check with Burns and see what uh, Burns has to ask. Yeah. Anybody have any questions at Burns? Yeah, you're saying that uh, large down woodies were historically never a part of the ponderosa pine environment? Not to the extent they are today. They couldn't possibly have been because if you had a fire uh, covering an area every two to four years, uh, it'd be difficult for that to remain very long. Now, some of it does. If, if it doesn't consume in the first time and it chars, uh, you know what it's like trying to get charcoal to get started. Uh, it kind of protects itself after that. So yes, there was large material uh, pre-settlement times, but not nearly what we have today, I don't think. Any other questions? Well, how important is, uh, well, you know, we're, we hear about uh, long-term site productivity, mycorrhizae, et cetera, and we're getting pressure to leave a considerable number of these large pieces out there. <laughs> it's, but, it, you know, you can't get fire and large down woodies in the same piece of ground. I know it's a problem all over, and uh, I think the, the soils people have a very different view of, of uh, what happens and what naturally happened uh, in these environments. And uh, I, I, I hate to disagree with them, but I, I don't agree with, with leaving all that woody material out there because I don't think it ever existed before. Okay, let's go on to uh, Blue Mountain Thank you. and Pendleton. Any questions there, folks? No questions. Go ahead, get close to it. Any questions? Go ahead. <laughs> we see you. We don't have any questions. Get a little closer. Oh, nope, no, she questions. said no questions. Okay, great, thanks. <coughs> we'll go on to John Day then. A great turnout. <laughs> really. I have one quick John question. Day. What was the... Uh, Fuel load, you said again, 90 to what uh, pounds per acre? Was that underneath the pine? 90 to 120,000. Yeah, in, um, uh, in uh, well, I, I'm just looking at my um, depth weight relationships in, in the area that we work, and uh, uh, two and a half inches of forest floor is, is 20 tons and you go up to six inches and uh, it's uh, greater than 60 tons to the acre. And you have gotta remember that these are concentrated loads around uh, in these yellow pine sites and uh, they accumulate a whole lot more fuel in a, in a year's time than uh, do the pole stands or the dog hair thickets. Any other questions? I have a question on nutrient cycling um you mentioned that the nitrogen levels increased after the fire um is there any sort uh nitrogen fixing plants down what was the last part of that question? come back on that again if you would we couldn't hear the last part of your question um is there how would nitrogen be replaced that's lost when uh, nitrogen's lost in the consumption of the fuel during the fire itself? What is the nitrogen fixing? How does the nitrogen get fixed back into the system? Uh, it's a direct, a direct deposit as, as far as we can see. And uh, then the nitrate levels, after, after that ammonia is in the uh, soil, uh, the critters get to working on that and the nitrate levels increase um, say the next spring after, and uh, continue to increase for about two years after that. But it's a direct deposition of, of ammonia into the soil. Another question? Uh, go ahead. Um, the, it, it, I'd like to follow up though. I'm, sh I'm sure that's where the, 
than ammonium and nitrate come from it, or the ammonium comes from is direct deposition. But as any, but as we burn the fuel, nitrogen is lost from the site in the fire, and is that replaced into to the ecosystem uh, through any pathway? What was the last part of that? Is it? Is that is that uh, placed into the ecosystem for, from uh, through any uh, pathway? Oh, yeah, the continuation of, of needle cast that, uh, like I say, on a four-year rotation, we surge that ammonium level uh, every time we burn. So, it, yes, we lose a lot in that initial uh, fire, uh, but what you put into the system is far more than gets in there naturally. And then each time you burn, you've still got this gigantic accumulation that occurs every year, and uh, it just keeps recycling. That's system. Sort of, I'm going to break this up into two different parts, um, and I feel much more comfortable talking about the first part of my talk because I'll be talking about my own research. Then I'm going to try to extend some of my findings uh, over the last decade or so of research to situations that I actually have read about because, quite honestly, I've never really been in eastern Oregon forests. Um, I hope to visit some tomorrow morning on my way out of here. But uh, I'm going to try to extend some of my like I said, my research findings and see if I could make some suggestions about things that might happen in, uh, with the amphibians and reptiles that occur here in eastern Oregon. Um, I think we're ready to go. Well, before you go, Henry, when you ask questions, be sure and push your buttons because they are working. Okay, thanks. All right, the reason I study or <clears throat> am interested in fire ecology uh, is shown right here. Um, as Steve alluded to, for four months a year, um, Central Florida actually leads the world in the frequency of lightning strikes. In, in certain times, uh, June, July, August, uh, we can record 2,000 lightning strikes in a county in an hour to give you some idea of the intensity. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about two different kinds of habitats. The first one is shown here. This, let me see if I could zoom in on this a little bit. Um, the first one is a, is a kind of habitat called scrub habitat, which is shown here by this really dark red stuff. It occurs mostly along the central portion of, uh, of, of Florida and little patches along the outer ridges, and some of it actually gets up into Alabama. But I have considerably more information about the yellow habitat which is a sandhill habitat. And I'll show you some slides and explain each of those to you. But I just want you to get some feeling for the distribution of those habitats in Florida. Again, the scrub habitat is a much older habitat. <clears throat> it's called ancient scrub. Ancient in Florida means it's 40,000 or so years old. Um, and it probably existed when most of Florida was nothing but a, a, a series, perhaps even a series of islands, um, which is now down the central portion of what's called the Lake Wales Ridge in Florida. Uh, when, when the sea levels were a bit higher than they are today. Um, scrub habitat <coughs> is characterized by um, different kinds of trees. This is a, um, a sand pine, which I'll, I think I can show you a better shot of that in a little while. It's a relatively open habitat, at least even in mature scrub habitat, it's relatively open. Um, it's got things like rosemary and a whole series of plants whose closest relatives are actually in southern Arizona in the desert south southwest United States. Um, there's, there's some very definite ties both through the botanical and um, zoological findings in, in, in uh, sandhill and scrub habitat in Florida with the desert southwest. And again, for historical reasons and, and things that I'm not going to go into today, but it really makes a, a pretty interesting story. I'll just show you a couple of shots of, of, uh, of the scrub habitat. The, the cones that you find on these pine trees are called serotonous cones and that <coughs> they require fire actually to, to, to cause the opening of the cone to germinate. So that opening um, occurs after the, the sand is burned. 
So you get very even age stands. And if you'll notice here, the, the diameters of, of these trees are, are very similar in diameter. So, so you get a, a, a stand for stand replacement. Um, scrub habitat doesn't burn all that frequently, perhaps every 70 or 80 year periodicity. Uh, some scrubs perhaps a little bit more frequent than that. But there's simply not enough fuel accumulating in these uh, scrubs to, to really support a very high frequency of fire. <clears throat> so when they do burn, it is a devastating, it's a, it's a catastrophic burn. Um, many of the scrubs in Florida, um, although there isn't much left, quite honestly, there isn't much of any habitat left in Florida, quite honestly. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I think I'm far enough away from Florida to say that. Uh, the, 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 uh, we, we are doing some control burning. We're trying to, to uh, again, learn more about these habitats before there's nothing left to study. Fire comes through. This is a, a, perhaps a year or so after a fire. You can see some of the, the stems and so on that have been left. Um, it is devastating, and there would be, uh, in, in a few years after this, you'd see lots of seedlings, and you'd again get the replacement with an even age stand. <coughs> Some of the control burnings that we're doing further south from Tampa, from where I live, um, this is actually at a biological research station in, in central Florida called Archbold Biological Research Station. It's uh, oh, about 10,000 or so acres, and it's it burned in different periodicities, and this is where I've conducted some of my studies. The fires are hot, very intense. Um, and, and devastating. Um, this is a palmetto stand. All of these are the, the trunks of palmettos. I'll show you a palmetto in a few minutes. Um, and you would think that this is absolutely totally wiped out. But in reality, these palmettos, if you were to come back, well, I'd give them two or three months to, to get back, but, but they, they would come back and they would be green again and, and can survive even that intense heat. Um, they also, uh, these are probably all the same, genetically the same individual. They're all probably related to one another. Perhaps even all the palmettos in Florida might actually be related to one another. The other habitat, which I'm going to talk a bit more about in a little bit more detail, is uh, what I showed you earlier was the yellow habitat, the sand hill habitat. And it's characterized by um, turkey oaks. I don't know that you need to see the leaves very well, but it's a, it's a fairly characteristic oak leaf. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this particular photograph here is taken of a, uh, of a patch of sand hill that hasn't burned in about 30 years. Um, sand hill has a, has a very rapid or very high fire periodicity, perhaps even every five to seven or 10 years. Again, one of the goals of our research is to try to um, establish what a natural periodicity might be so that we can manage, use this as a management tool uh, for those little patches of, of natural habitat that are left in Florida. Another shot will show, this is, uh, again, some of the palmettos that I mentioned to you. And notice that, that there isn't really much ground cover in here at all. Um, the, the major grass in here is Aristida, which is a wire grass, which is a, a fire promoting and in fact requires fire to, for the grass to set seed. So this is a fire-maintained ecosystem. Um, historically, there's very good evidence to suggest that Florida perhaps used to burn, perhaps even from coast to coast, um, before we got in there and built all the bridges and highways and, and fragmented that habitat up into lots of tiny little parcels. Um, clearly, fire was, was much more able to spread from, from one side of the state to the other. And <clears throat> even the, uh, the native Indians and so on were, were very good at using fire and, and maintained their systems uh, through, through uh, perhaps, I don't think they call them prescribed burns, but nevertheless, they, uh, they set the fires. But you also have to remember that, that Florida has a bit of a different history than most of North America, quite honestly, because it's had a, a European influence for hundreds of years. So it's very difficult for a biologist like myself to know what is a natural system in Florida, because it really, we don't know where to go to find a natural system. It's all been um, altered by, let's just say, over the last four or 500 years in ways that we, we have, we're having a hard time now piecing it, piecing it back together. But clearly, fire was an integral part of the natural history of, of all of the upland systems. And again, I'm, I'm just talking about two of the upland systems, the scrub and the sand hill. <clears throat> well, at the university where I teach, the University of South Florida, we've been um, doing um, fire ecology research uh, since the, the mid-'70s. Um, we have plots that are broken up, or, or a relatively large chunk of land is broken up into small plots, and these plots are burned on different periodicities, much like what Steve was saying. 
some plots on a one year cycle, two years, five years, seven years, nine years, and so on. Other plots that have been protected from fire for perhaps as many as 30 years. And we sort of call them control plots, but they're really not control in, in, the, in the real sense that a scientist might use the word control. Um, but again, we, we, uh, we do a spring burn, um, spring to uh, perhaps summer burns. Um, the, the greatest intensity of lightning well, again, just so that you're, you're understanding why we're doing this. Um, our summer season starts about mid-May, and that's when our lightning storms begin. And every afternoon, virtually every afternoon, we generate our own uh, conductive currents and, and our own thunder and lightning storms. So the, the greatest frequency of fires actually occur um, in May and June, uh, and at that time you get the greatest amount of, of acreage that would be burned during those, those months. So again, we do control burning, uh, prescribed burning. And <clears throat> again, I'm a zoologist. I'm interested in the, in the animal responses to those fires. And I, I will get to it in, the, in a minute, I promise you. Um, we can actually control, very much control, the, uh, the canopy cover. This is a plot that burns every two years. I just want you to give you a feeling for what fires can do to these different kinds of habitats. This is a plot that burns every two years. And you notice there's relatively sparse canopy compared to those first few shots I showed you where in those, the canopy cover was perhaps as much as 70 or 80 percent. In a place like this that burns every two years, we get a canopy coverage that's down to perhaps uh, 20 or so percent. This is a plot that burns every five years, and you get maybe 30 or so percent coverage. So this is about midway into a five-year cycle, and you can see the tremendous amount of regrowth that we get in that five-year period. Um, tremendous amount of grasses and herbs and so on. Well, let's get to the, to the herbs. Um, one animal that we have that you don't have that is truly an integral part of this system is the gopher tortoise. And really, it is because of the gopher tortoise that I have an interest in fire ecology. I, I started studying gopher tortoises uh, or a dozen or so years ago when I first got to Florida. And, and the, <clears throat> the gopher tortoise and fire um, brought my research together, actually. Gopher tortoises are um, such an important part of the system that we really refer to them as a keystone species. <laughs> In the absence of a gopher tortoise, the upland systems in um, Florida in particular, but in other parts of the southeast as well, will actually decay, and, and the biodiversity will decline precipitously in the absence of a gopher tortoise. And it's not the tortoise per se that's the integral part of this, but it's the burrows that they dig. Tortoises dig extensive burrows. This just illustrates the mouth of the burrow. Here you can see, uh, perhaps on the screen where I'm showing you, um, but that burrow could be 30 to 50 feet in length, and by the time you're at the bottom of that burrow, you can be 25 feet below the surface of the ground. And that burrow serves as a refuge for a tremendous number of species. We have documented over 300 other species of organisms that live and spend time in that gopher tortoise burrow. So with <clears throat> what, what brought this together then is in the absence of fire, when tree canopy increases, gopher tortoises abandon that habitat, and hence the burrows uh, eventually will decay. In fact, in a year or so, a burrow will decay. So in the absence of fire, the tortoises are forced out of the habitat, the burrows decay, and the whole biodiversity goes down the tube. And that occurs in decades. I mean, this is not something where we're talking about centuries or, or millennia to occur. This could actually occur in, in two to three decades. Um, in this kind of sandhill habitat. So again, it is my interest as a herpetologist in gopher tortoises and other organisms and their response to fire that, that again, brought these things together in my mind. So we don't have, a, or you don't have the, the equivalent uh, reptile here in, in eastern Oregon, but you do have other burrowing animals that I'm sure provide refuge for uh, many of the other snakes and, and salamanders and so on that you'll find here. Again, one last shot of the tortoise about to enter into uh, her burrow. The tortoise gets up, up to about a, a foot or so in length, um, perhaps 10 pounds or so, and they're just avid diggers. They, they just can displace a tremendous amount of ground. You just can't believe how well they can, they can dig through the, the soils. Again, we're also talking about Florida, where I use the word soil very loosely with the soil, soil scientists here. It's really sand. Um, it has no horizon, so it's very difficult to even call them soils. Some of the species that I've worked with and, and I'll just share some of my findings with you without going through and showing you data. Um, these things are published. If you care to go back and read some of the papers, I gladly will, will 
um, provide that information for you. This is a, uh, a six-lined race runner. It is an animal that reaches its absolute maximum abundance uh, in areas that burn very, very frequently. So it's an animal that typically inhabits very wide, open habitats, so it, it uh, clearly is attracted to um, very high periodicities. It does extremely well in our one and two year plots. In plots that don't burn in 20 or 25 years, you rarely will see one, except around the very edge of those plots. So clearly, again, you can see the relationship between fire periodicity um, and the, uh, the relative abundance of some of our amphibians or reptiles. This is a skink, and you have a similar skink here. Um, a skink is just a, a, <coughs> it's a, a family of, of reptiles, skinkidae. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have uh, data to suggest that really high periodicities of fire actually are not very good for skinks. They spend an awful lot of their time at and below the, uh, or right at the interface between the, the soils and whatever leaf cover or litter might be present. So if you continually remove that leaf litter, um, you're really altering their habitat in a way that, that is not very conducive for them. Um, this is just a, another species that occurs just a little bit further north in Florida. But skinks have a behavior, and it's true of your skink here in, in Oregon as well, where the females will actually spend time with their young. And the females will move the, their eggs in and out of shelters and so on on a day-to-day -day basis. So while a female is, is tending her eggs, and this happens to be a, an individual just coming out of an egg right here, while the female is tending her eggs, you don't see adult females in the population at all. Um, and she will spend um, a good two months or so in seclusion with her eggs. So if you're burning at the time of the year when she is um, tending her eggs, you can probably be quite destructive to, to the skinks as well. Um, they typically will nest in very moist areas or relatively moist areas below logs or actually sometimes in logs, uh, much as this one was. We just tore the log away when we were just before I took this, this photograph. Uh, but again, even our more moderate periodicities, a five-year or seven-year periodicities, does not seem to affect these in a detrimental way. So it's this really almost unnaturally high periodicity that seems to have a negative effect upon, upon skinks. Um, we have a large variety of snakes. This happens to be one of the more common uh, snakes in, in the very loose soils in, in central Florida. Um, this is a pine needle for, for, uh, for measure. So this is an animal that is, is mature at perhaps eight or 10 inches in length and spends almost its entire life below the ground. And again, fire on any periodicity doesn't seem to have any detrimental effects upon the relative abundance of this particular snake. <clears throat> Another snake that, since I have all these tools here and I can play with them, um, this is a ring neck snake, um, belly up. You have ring neck snakes here. Um, it's actually the same species. The, <clears throat> you can see if you look at the very end of the, of the pen, there's the, the ring around its neck. Um, again, we have somewhat limited data, but, but our data do suggest that ring necks are not either positively or negatively influenced by any of our fire periodicities. In the absence of fire, however, the relative abundance of these animals decreases. So they are dependent upon some kind of fire periodicity. Even the, our 10-year fields support pretty high populations of, of ring necks. But they're not terribly common. It's not nearly as common as um, this is that, that Florida crown snake, the one I showed you just a few minutes ago. Actually, um, I'll throw in a little herpetology here. This ring neck snake regurgitated this Florida crown snake. So th this is actually a predator-prey relationship we're looking at here as well. In, in this situation, the prey organism was actually a little bit larger than the predator. Think about that. <laughs> <coughs> we have um, a variety of frogs, uh, amphibians that live in and around central Florida. Um, actually, throughout the whole southeast United States, we've got a fairly high abundance of, of amphibians. This happens to be one of the more common. It's a green tree frog. You have Pacific tree frogs and others that occur throughout this area. Um, as you would, might imagine, tree frogs, as, as most amphibians, are found in close association with water. Um, I'll show you a few in, in a few minutes that get several hundred or perhaps even a thousand meters away from the nearest water. But most tree frogs are really tied to water. So if, <clears throat> unless your, your fire is, 
is a, a catastrophic fire where you would burn right up to the edge of water. These guys would, would seek refuge, and they're extremely uh, well adept at, at avoiding fires. When we set a fire, um, there's a, a line of tree frogs moving away from that fire several hundred meters in, in advance of, of, the, of the fire line. Um, long before a human would be able to, to detect the fire, unless you were able to see it, of course. But these guys are, are really um, good at, at avoiding the, the heat and the, the, the nasty aspects of fire. Another small frog, uh, it's called Hyla femoralis, and the, the, the name comes from the fact that it has some yellow spots on its thigh. This animal occurs in, in all of the habitats that I mentioned to you, both the sand hill and the scrub habitat, and it actually lives um, very often in the palmetto leaves. And when palmetto leaves burn, we've measured temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees centigrade in palmettos. So we know that they burn very hot, very, very hot. And yet, again, you can go into an area a few weeks after a burn, and you'll find um, all of the amphibians back there. <clears throat> there probably is a decline, actually, several weeks or several months after a fire, perhaps reflecting the fact that the insects um, probably decline for some short period of time. But in a year or so after a fire, clearly there is um, almost no evidence at all, negative evidence or, or um, evidence that suggests that the populations of amphibians or reptiles are declining because of that fire. We also find, um, with perhaps one or two exceptions over the last 10 years where I've been doing this, um, almost no direct effects of fire. That is, we're not toasting the animals out there. Um, box turtles and a few, a few species of, of turtles have a problem avoiding the fire. Um, certainly not the gopher tortoise, because it could just run right down its burrow. But there are a few species uh, of, of larger, um, I think most of you know what a box turtle looks like, uh, would have a bit of a problem. Although you don't have those kinds of turtles here again, so I, I can't speak that it would have any kind of, uh, it would create similar problems here for you in, in eastern Oregon. Um, this is a toad. You have a toad here, which I'll mention in a few minutes. Um, toads are often found some great distances away from water, but the, those toads that are found in Florida at any rate, and I suspect it's true here, away from water, spend most of their life below the ground. They're excellent burrowers and can easily burrow down to a depth of a, of a foot or so. Again, this is Florida that I'm talking about with, uh, with no soils and, and nothing but really sand but they are very good at avoiding the heat of the fire or actually the heat of the day. When Yesterday afternoon it was 94 degrees in Tampa, so it's, uh, <clears throat> I've measured soil temperatures. The surface of sand is 140 degrees in Florida. So um, it isn't just the heat of a fire that these organisms have to learn to avoid, it's the heat of the day as well. So any organism that lives in Florida has to deal with different kinds of heat. We have a variety of snakes. This is what we call a, a pine snake um, throughout much of the country. It's called the gopher snake. It's the same species again, Pituophis melanolucus. Um, we've done work with radio transmitters and so on on them. They spend in excess of 97% of their life below ground. <clears throat> it's a large animal. It can get up to five or six feet in length. Um, they eat mice and in particular, or rodents is, is perhaps more accurate, and in particular a um, a gopher, a pocket gopher, uh, which also burrows below the ground. So these animals spend an awful lot of time in the um, burrows created by the pocket gopher, and every once in a while will ingest one or two, uh, given the opportunity. So again, the point I'm trying to make is that we see fire, you know, <clears throat> as, as, uh, as humans, we look at fire, and, and so often we, we see it as a really negative thing. I don't think the uh, amphibians and reptiles are seeing it quite through those same eyes. This is a a coach whip, um, you have a similar species, not exactly the same species, but a similar species that occurs throughout this whole region of the country. Um, again, a very excellent burrowing animal. It's a bit more terrestrial than the, than the pine snake, but um, uh, an excellent burrower and will often seek shelter down gopher tortoise burrows or any of the rodent burrows or squirrels. Uh, some of our squirrels actually create some small burrows, and you, of course, have, have ground squirrels, which do, do burrow. Um, so. Again, uh, I, I, I can't tell you, I have, we don't have enough data on these larger snakes. They're just too rare, too uncommon to, 
to have enough data that we've actually published on, but, but there are uh, every indication that, that they can survive fires quite well. <coughs> Excuse me. I just threw in one more snake. This is another small burrowing snake. Um, again, comparable to some of the animals that you have in, in eastern Oregon that uh, just spends an awful lot of time below ground. This is one that happens to eat um, reptile eggs. And of course, you don't find reptile eggs very often sitting on the ground anyway. They're usually buried down in the ground. So this actually will find and seek out reptile eggs below the ground and ingest the egg without ever coming to the surface. Two lizards that I'll, last two lizards I think that I'll show you are very, very, very similar to two lizards that you have here. The same genus again. These are fence lizards. Um, you have two scoloporus uh, lizards out here. This is uh, the eastern fence lizard. Excellent climber but also an excellent burrower. Um, they nest below the ground and spend an awful lot of their time below the ground. The one that occurs in our scrub habitat, here is this Scoloporus woodeye. It just became a, a federally protected species. It is now a threatened species. Again, primarily because of habitat destruction. Um, obviously a, a very good tree climber. This is in, a, in an oak tree. Um, but again, when it's not up in the oak trees and active during the day, it is always below the ground. So the fires, um, <coughs> regardless of the time of the year or even the time of the day that you're burning, these guys can avoid the, the heat of the fire and, and, and avoid it quite well. We have very few salamanders. This is an animal that actually came from Hillsborough County, which is where Tampa is. Um, for a variety of reasons, our soil conditions are poor. There's, we go through uh, very wet periods of the year, but we also have a fairly long extended dry period of the year and these guys really can't tolerate the dry aspects. Um, I only put this in to remind myself to mention something about your salamanders. You have a, a few salamanders here um, that I'll, I'll point out again in just a few minutes that are burrowing salamanders. They actually belong to a family of salamanders called the mole salamanders. And as you can all imagine, mole salamanders are named that because they spend an awful lot of time below the ground. <clears throat> this is a, a Gary Larson cartoon uh, to sort of summarize what a lot of people feel about fire. It's, it's frustrating. You don't quite know what to do with it, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, the word down here, if you can't read it, is fire, and you can see the lady screaming fire out the, the window. Well, when I was um, asked to, to come here and, and talk to you, um, again, quite honestly, I'm my background is, is, is strictly in zoology. I'm a, a, a herpetologist, if anything. Um, I went and, and started doing some, some quick research on fire in eastern Oregon. And <clears throat> I asked a few questions uh, of myself uh, that I'm going to share with you very quickly. Again, I, I think you, you probably know this stuff better than I do. Uh, one is, well, what kind of history does Oregon have uh, for fires. And clearly you can go back over a hundred years and document some extreme, extremely large fires uh, going through the tail hook or Talamook, excuse me, <laughs> tail hook, Talamook. <laughs> it was a Freudian slip, I'm afraid. <laughs> Up until very recently, Eastern Oregon in, in uh, 1986 and 1987 had some extensive fires. And again, you probably know that uh, far better than I do. And I also asked myself, well, what kind of fire periodicities uh, do you find in, in these different kinds of, fi of forests in Oregon? Um, and I was surprised, quite honestly, that some of your uh, different forest types have, have fairly high periodicities. <clears throat> From the literature, I was able to find Ponderosa pine, and here is listed as a 15-year cycle. Uh, obviously, there's in other places, it might even be more, more frequent than that. But you also have subalpine in other places, uh, other kinds of far forests, excuse me, that burn far less frequently. Um, again, just to uh, I'm sort of giving you the, the kind of background that I felt I needed to, to go through to, to talk to you. Then I went to, uh, as a herpetologist, I thought, well, what kind of, of, of amphibians and reptiles really do we find uh, in, in eastern Oregon? Um, <coughs> and, and perhaps now you can see the reason why I showed you some of the slides. The first two lizards are fence lizards, and I, um, I tried to make the point when I was going through some of my data that I had in, in Florida that fence lizards are extremely well adept at, at getting out of the way of fire. Um, I threw in side blocks and, and shorthorn there. If you looked at a map, um, 
they're found in eastern Oregon, not quite exactly where we are now in eastern Oregon, but in much open, uh, more arid conditions. In turtles, there's only a painted turtle, and that's, that's an aquatic turtle, and I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, one snake that I have a, a bit of a question about is a rubber boa. Um, it is an animal that we don't know a whole he heck of a lot about. <coughs> um, and and uh, is in fact a protected species. I mentioned a ring neck snake to you, uh, whip snakes, um, several of the others, uh, <coughs> garter snakes and so on. All of these, in my opinion, quite honestly, are, um, are not likely to be found in really high dense forests. These are animals that are more likely to be found on edges or ecotowns or in areas where you'd find some kind of open habitat because most of these are actually either um, mammal or fish eaters, and obviously the fish eaters are gonna need the water to, to forage in, um, <clears throat> but you don't find really high densities of mammals in really high uh, overgrowth forests. So again, um, if, if, the, if the concern is what is prescribed burning or what is fire gonna do to the amphibians and reptiles that occur here, um, my feeling is that it's probably going to actually increase their abundance, if anything. Um, we, we can do the same thing with amphibians. If I could find my, there it is. You have several, uh, several <coughs> amphibians, salamanders and, and, uh, and anurans or frogs. Again, both of these salamanders occur to a family uh, the, the ambistomatidae that are mole salamanders and spend the vast majority of their life below ground. Um, the frogs that I mentioned to you, you have a spade foot toad, actually I, I didn't mention, but we also have a spade foot toad in Florida and they're burrowing animals. They spend the vast majority of their life below the ground. They come up at night to forage or they will come up at the certain times of the year during very wet periods of, of the year uh, for reproductive reasons. But again, that's, they're going to the water to, to do this. The tailed frog is, a, uh, is an aquatic species. Um, Western toad is a good burrower. Pacific tree frog, I can't say a whole heck of a lot about. Um, they occur in a variety of habitats, a, a, a huge variety of habitats, as a matter of fact. Um, but the, the, the last two species here, the spotted and leopard frog, are ranids and, again, um, are primarily aquatic amphibians. So my guess is that even if you were, all of these amphibians will wander away from water at times um, to, for foraging and for those kinds of reasons. But when they are far away from water and they're not foraging, they are burrowed down uh, well into the ground. Well, <clears throat> I'm obviously running a little long on this, but let me, let me just sort of uh, cut to the quick here. It seems uh, to me that one of the, one of the things that one sh should be concerned about is, um, is prescribed burning. We've been doing it in the southeast United States, uh, for actually for several decades, and uh, there are researchers around the world that are interested and have been studying um, prescribed burns now for, oh, for decades, quite honestly. Um, <clears throat> and if, if your goal, again, I'm speaking as a herpetologist, not, not as, a, as a forester. Uh, if the goal is to try to get the system back to a natural system, or as close to a natural system as we think it can be, then clearly burning is a part, an integral part of all of these systems. I, I, I suspect that's true for all North American upland systems. It's just the periodicity that we're, we're talking about. So one of the things you want, or one of the things that has come out of, of the research, uh, if we can just look at this a little bit. <coughs> from, again, from my opinion, or from my position, you would want to uh, minimize the effects of a prescribed burn on on large lo rotten logs and on the forest floor. Those things, I think, for a variety of reasons, need to be protected as much as can be. Now clearly, um, as you just heard, that first burn is, is, is a difficult one. When you've kept fire out for a century, um, you're gonna do some damage. There's simply no way about it. No, I don't think there's any way to, to avoid that. But <clears throat> one of the things you certainly should consider is burning at the right time of the year to minimize the effects upon wildlife. And the right time of the year is when there's a high moisture content. So there's a, a relationship here between fire duration and moisture content, and these arrows are going in opposite directions. So if you can burn under the wettest possible conditions, obviously it has to be relatively dry to carry the fire, or at least reasonably dry to carry the fire, 
but you burn when things are as wet as they can, you would, you would cut down on the damage to um, even the large fuels, of course, and then the forest floor and the large rotten logs. And I think that would go a long way in, in protecting the uh, amphibians and reptiles that if they are in those forests that haven't been burned in a long period of time, are certainly going to be found in the litter layer or below that litter layer at any rate. And um, again, from my way of thinking, um, well, as we, we had this conversation earlier, sooner or later, the forests are going to burn. There's, there's simply nothing we are going to do to, to stop that from occurring. What we want to do is minimize the hazards of those fires. And we can minimize those hazards by, by prescribed fires. And it might take, again, as Steve mentioned, it's not just something you could go in and do one time. I think you have to, uh, once you break that ground and, and, and uh, start using a prescribed burn, um, it's something that you have to maintain for a long period of time until you got that system back to where you thought natural periodicities might again be able to take over. Now, <clears throat> I, th that's not even possible in Florida. It may still be possible out here. Um, we have 15 million people in Florida. A thousand people a day move to Florida. Think about that, folks. Um, we simply can't, there's no such thing as natural in Florida at any rate. The, the, the patches of land that are there have to be managed. Um, we do get some natural fire, even, even in our ecological research area where we do a lot of, of, of fire ecology. In the last decade, we had three natural fires. Um, fortunately, it didn't in, interfere with our, with our fire research. They were in places where the, the fires were sort of irrelevant to, to our research. But <clears throat> our habitats are now so fragmented that even if a fire did start, the likelihood of it spreading and doing any kind of real uh, of functioning as a natural fire is almost, uh, it, it just can't happen anymore. The, the areas are so fragmented and so on. So again, I guess if there is a, a, a bottom line here, what, what we see as the best technique, the way to maintain the highest biodiversity is to maintain a mosaic of habitats. Have plots of land that burn on different periodicities, different cycles, some that burn often, some that don't burn too often at all, some perhaps that don't burn at all. Over, over much longer periods of time. But it is, it is that mosaic that seems to be the critical part for maintaining the highest biodiversity. And, I, and I'm, I'm not just speaking of amphibians and reptiles. That also includes all of the vertebrates as well as the plants. The way to maintain the highest plant species diversity is to, is to keep, your, uh, keep the patchiness in the habitats. And, and um, you can accomplish that by prescribed burning on different, different periodicities. And I thank you. If there are questions, I'd glad to answer. Questions from What you're saying is we are on a maybe a hundred year cycle of fire suppression. I don't think we any of us have ever heard a biologist or a zoologist suggest that maybe we have some amphibians that are maybe a reason they're noticeably short in uh, pop in uh, numbers maybe because of this but th this is really enlightening for us northwesterners well, I think amphibians are having other problems I, I, I'm not trying to I don't know if you're familiar with the idea that there's a, a worldwide amphibian decline at least there's a suspected worldwide amphibian decline I don't think we could attribute all of that to, to fire suppression but clearly uh, Again, I, I, I can't, I don't just don't know how comfortable I am extrapolating from, from the information we have in Florida. But clearly, if we suppress fire for even a few decades, we can see a precipitous decline in the number of vertebrates that use those forests. There, there's simply no question about that. Others? Yes? Yeah, Henry, I think what um, you're bucking a little bit of conventional wisdom around here, and we go to great lengths um, currently to try and keep fire out of our riparian areas and our riparian zones. And, and I, I understand you're, you're somewhat out of way beyond your ecotone here. So if, if um, I'm wondering whether that relationship, what you said about fire occurrence in those riparian areas and the relationship with amphibians, whether it's going to uh, have an effect here in the Northwest. I, I honestly wouldn't think so. Um, these organisms just didn't appear here 100 years ago. And if we go back 1,000 years or 10,000 years, 
Um, my guess is that occasionally the fires went right up to the, water, to the edge of, of, of any aquatic system. Um, so again, <coughs> you're, you're really not going to... Uh, I, I don't think you can destroy the habitat to the point where you would actually cause the extinction of these species. I think you could knock them back, but again, if, you, if you're looking at something over a longer period of time, my guess is that the recovery would actually supersede the level that now exists. So if you're looking for long-term management, and again, I'm, I'm, t I'm talking about in perpetuity, um, you may see a three or five year decline in some of, uh, some of these species after you put through a hot, a real, if you will, a catastrophic kind of fire. Um, all evidence suggests, and it's not just from here, it's, it's from Australia, it's from Africa, it's from other, other continents as well, that the animals recover and, and do remarkably well and, and actually get back to um, the relative abundance exceeds what it was prior to the, to the fire. So, uh. Okay, we're turned on to Burns. Does Burns have anything uh, that they'd like to ask Henry? I have two questions. The first one is, what is your duration of heat in the prescribed fires in your five-year rough? Second question is, is it true that the threatened endangered animals, or the most of them, like the red cockaded woodpecker, I believe it is, in Florida, depends on prescribed fire or natural fire to exist? The second answer is yes, they do require fire. Um, and I think I could safely say that virtually all the species in Florida, whether they're endangered or not, do require some fire periodicity. Um, the first question, I think you asked me about the duration of the burn in the five-year plots. Our plots burn very, very quickly. We're talking about fires that will sweep through, um, oh, let's just say a 10-acre plot in perhaps 12 minutes. And within with 10 minutes after that fire, you can walk through, and it's beginning to cool down. But again, it is because of that periodicity. You, you burn up that fuel very, very quickly. Um, it's primarily grasses and, and herbaceous material that you're burning, as well as the palmettos and, and those things. Um, but the fire is very quick and short duration. I, did that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Thank you. I have a question from Pendleton. Nope, no questions. No, no questions? questions? Okay, thank you. John Day? Any questions from John Day? No questions. All right, thanks. Go to Ontario. No questions. Any questions in Ontario? No questions. All right, thank you. Wallawa? Any questions from Wallawa? No questions? Okay, thank you. One, one question? Was there a question? Did we pass somebody up? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't think we're, we we got our. Hang in there, buddy. <laughs> okay. Let's see now. John Day. Uh, John Day had a question last time that we passed up, wasn't it, John Day? Okay, let's go back to John Day, and they had a question they wanted to ask Steve, I believe, one of the fellows there. You want to ask your question of Steve and John Day there? Right, right. I was wondering about the, the layer of the, the depth of the duff on the big pine, and he had a 46% die ratio. What, 
what can you do about that? How can you avoid the death? Uh, <clears throat> uh, the one thing that we have found is that um, uh, the soil moisture being high has, has a lot to do with it, that it becomes a heat sink and a lot of that energy is absorbed by the water in the soil and thus doesn't get to the, uh, to the root systems. And uh, our two situations were, one was a very dry soil burn and the other was very wet and we lost lots of trees in the dry situation and virtually none in the, in the wet situation. That take care of it? Yes, thank you. Okay, any other questions there, folks? Okay. Any other questions? Could I, could I interject something? Sure that, Go that, that goes hand in hand with the point I was trying to make at the very end of this. That is, if you, <clears throat> if you really are going to try to minimize the, the, the detrimental effects of the fire on, on the trees or the wildlife, I think you have to try to burn, um, at least the first burn has to be under fairly wet conditions. Um, it's not a pretty burn, it's not a, it's not a very complete burn, but um, it might actually make that first step a little less detrimental. Uh, and, and by having that high moisture content, you're, you're certainly protecting the, the forest floor that's providing insulation for the roots of the trees, and it's certainly providing insulation for any of the organisms that are likely to be burrowed down um, below that forest floor. Any okay, several in the back. Yeah, I think we, we've got a complex system here. Uh, I think we heard last week that there were some plants that don't do real well under uh, conditions where uh, where we have prescribed burnings at times of the year that's not quote natural. Uh, there, uh, and so when we choose the times of the year that are more moist, we may we may lose some of our species that are adapted to for fires uh, because they're not present when fires normally occur in the dry times of the year. So it's a, it could be a very complex situation. Yeah. One of the things I, I, I skipped over, but um, I was going to try to allude to what we call focal species. And if you do have species that have specific requirements, perhaps the rubber bow would be as, as close as I could get for, from the amphibians or reptiles that I was talking about. Um, and, and if that organism is such that you really have to pay special attention to it, then I think you have to work around that. <clears throat> I, I, I would rather even step back one, one step further, and that is um, before you do anything, burn or not burn, is you should really know exactly what you want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. What is the goal? Wh why do we want to do this? And if everybody in this room or everybody in Eastern Oregon came up with the same answer, then life would be very pretty. And, we, and you would know exactly what you want to accomplish. But to, <clears throat> again, I, I feel like an outsider coming in here. Um, we, we deal with this all the time in terms of management. And we <clears throat> I, I'm up against the wall constantly in Florida in terms of making management decisions on habitat. Um, the, first, the first question I have to ask is, well, what is it you want to accomplish? What, do we really want to reestablish a natural system? If, if that's the case, then I think you have to bite the bullet and burn during the regular season when, when you think this fire should occur. And once you get the forest back to a reasonably good condition, then perhaps you can just let it go and let it be a natural system. Again, I, I think there's a possibility that that, that could still exist here in, in, in Eastern Oregon. I, again, I, I'm just not that familiar with, with this part of the country. Um, clearly in Florida, that's, that's not a situation that can happen anymore. Um, but uh, if you don't have your goals very well defined, then you really wind up probably doing more damage than, than good in the long run. And <clears throat> if you were to bring in the botanists and the, and the, the, the mycologists with their mycorrhizal associations and the zoologists and the, and the, the forestry people, and get all of their heads together um, as best that can be accomplished, then I think you would at least be able to define the, the specific goals. And then once you have your goal, it, I think it's, it's much easier to know exactly how to attack the problem. Um, it, it isn't clear in my mind that the goal has really been defined in exactly what, what folks want to accomplish here yet.
again, I'm an outsider. That, that, that isn't necessarily a negative statement. I don't mean it to be a negative statement, but I think it's just sort of a, a reality statement. Other questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> what problems do you have with Homo sapiens in regards to prescribed fire in Florida? Tremendous problems. Um, the area where we do our burning, right across the street, is um, a complex of about 6,000 condominiums. <coughs> and believe, believe me, they don't like our fires. Um, we are actually now, when the university was built 30 years ago, we were um, at the extreme edge uh, in the outskirts of, of Tampa. We are now in the city limits of Tampa. So um, we have to get um, city, county, and state, and forestry permits and so on before we can do our burning. Um, and, and clearly, one has to pay attention to the amount of smoke one's generating and, and the way the wind is blowing. We, we try to take into all those kinds of things. And that's part of, of a prescribed burn, is you, again, you really look at and weigh all of the variables and um, if you know exactly what you want to accomplish, then you know that, for example, you don't want to put smoke um, over large numbers of people for large amounts of time, <laughs> for, for a lot of obvious reasons. So, so one of the things you'd want to do is have your winds going in the proper direction. Uh, and this is all part of the, of the prescription. Um, it, it, is, it is becoming a science. I, I can't say it really is a science yet, but I think it is becoming a science. There's enough people working on it now. We're getting enough insight into um, how to do prescribed burning um, and looking at, at more and more variables. Uh, and we have to take humans into consideration, that's for sure. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but we, we do pay attention to people, for sure. We, we absolutely must. Outreach locations for either Steve or Henry. All right, let's give them a round of applause for coming this far. Thank you very much.